Good afternoon, and, uh, and welcome to, uh, to Google's uh, DC office. I'm Pablo Chavez. I'm a senior policy counsel here in our DC office, uh, and I'm part of uh, uh, the company's global public policy team. Um, over the last 10 years, a uh, pretty short period of time, we've developed a really good tradition of, uh, of inviting uh, a diverse set of speakers uh, to Google, to Google's various offices around the world, um, scientists, chefs, musicians, uh, Senator McCain, Senator Obama both uh, spoke at the Googleplex in, in Mountain View recently. Um, and so we're trying to, to bring that tradition and extend it to, uh, to DC. Um, in the spirit of, just, of uh, you know, good, strong discussion and debate, uh, we've had a series of Google DC talks, uh, which are open to the entire Washington community. Um, today's talk, uh, which we're going to follow with a reception uh, back there, uh, focuses on the emergence uh, of a new population of young people whose habits and behavior are destined to have a big impact on uh, the way that we live and the way that we work. Um, they're called by John Palfrey uh, and his co-author, uh, or as digital natives, those, teens, uh, those in their teens and their 20s who were the first generation born into and raised in the digital world. Digital natives not only um, have had access to the internet from a very early age, but they've also uh, become very comfortable sharing uh, their daily lives online. Um, you know, at least one of the digital natives on the panel um, has a blog where you know she shares about her you know, thoughts about the world. I think it's Russian history or, the, or, or, or photographs, yeah, um, and, and so on. And um, and certainly here at Google, I've spotted a, a digital native here and there. And, and there, there's certainly some uh, some in the audience. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys as, as we continue the discussion. Um, Certainly others have highlighted um, this, the existence and the uniqueness of this population before. Um, for example, former FCC Chairman Michael Powell calls digital natives homo digiteus, uh, people who have never put their finger in the dial of a rotary telephone. They've never known TV without a remote control. Uh, and they've never known life without a computer or a game console. Um, our distinguished speaker today, John Palfrey from the Berkman, Berkman Center, Harvard's Berkman Center, along with his co-author, Urs Gasser, uh, advanced the effort to identify, explain, and helped, uh, help guide digital natives um, with their new book, Born Digital. Um, it's really an effort to look at what uh, the emergence of digital natives means to our society. Um, and also joining us uh, today are uh, two digital natives. Well, we'll see, because right? maybe, maybe the definition doesn't stand. But uh, Sarah Zhang and uh, Diana Kimball, who also participate in the conversation, uh, about their cohort um, that will follow John's presentation. Um, by the way, we have copies of Born Digital available for sale right back there. Uh, I'm sure John would be happy to autograph uh, a copy for you. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really great book that I, that I actually finished reading a couple of nights ago uh, with my own four-year-old uh, digital native who pl actually played with my Blackberry uh, while I fi finished reading it. True story. I mean, he's very familiar with the thing. He was actually calling his grandmother. Um, um, it's, it's, a work that, it's a great work that, that really accomplishes uh, something that's very difficult to do, and that is um, really bring this world to, to many, many different audiences. So for example, uh, for parents, teachers, policymakers, and other sta uh, stakeholders, the book provides a really detailed and very enlightening uh, description of digital natives. And for the digital natives themselves, uh, the book is, is really both a mirror, uh, and it's also, also a really useful, uh, kind of high-level, holistic guide about the challenges and opportunities uh, that they should keep in mind as they, as they navigate through the digital world. Um, and what I really love about the book is that it's really not, it's not just a book. Uh, it's, it's really more of a, of a project. Uh, and it's part of the Digital Native Project uh, that John uh, started and is, and is heading up. Uh, you can find information about it at digitalnative.org. Uh, there you, you'll find links to the project's pages on, on Facebook, YouTube, MySpace, and other networks. There's also a blog and a wiki that you can actually participate in. Uh, and I've seen examples of this already with, uh, with for example, a review of your book uh, that was done uh, using the, the wiki. Um, so with all that, I'll, I'll introduce John. Um, and I actually had my own little paragraph about John, but I, but I found another one uh, on, um, on a blog, uh, <laughs> the Venture blog, uh, that describes uh, John in the following way. And I actually agree with, with, with all of this. Um, this is going to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm a huge fan of John Palfrey's. Uh, John has spent the better part of the last decade running Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Uh, on the side, he's been thrilling students in the classroom at Harvard Law School, doing research, charming would-be donors to the center, and moonlighting as a venture capitalist at Highland Capital. 
He is truly a renaissance man. Uh, I have the great fortune of co-teaching a class uh, on entrepreneurship and venture capital with John, uh, and he's a wonderfully understated speaker and thinker. So, so with, uh, with that, please join me in welcoming John. So it's a huge pleasure to have uh, a chance to talk with all of you about the research we've been doing on young people and, uh, and how they relate to one another, as we'll see some, uh, as they relate to information and as they relate to institutions, which is the basic topic of, uh, the, of this book. We wanted to do it, though, in a manner that's not kind of a standard book talk. Um, I've been doing a lot of these book talks, um, and it's kind of boring to stand up in front of a lecture and you know, give, uh, give a talk. And it also doesn't reflect, really, the nature um, of the conversation we're having. So um, what we wanted to do is uh, do it much more interactively and also to call on some of you um, to come to the mic relatively quickly. Um, but uh, Pablo asked uh, me to give kind of an overview of the project in the book, which I'll do briefly. I want to show you a few sort of interpretations of the book that exist on the web. I then want to ask my friends uh, Sarah and Diana, who were major participants in the creation of the book, um, uh, to react to a few things. And then we'll kind of take it, take it from there. Um, Bob Borston, our great friend from Google, also said to keep it all short. So everything's <laughs> going to be short in uh, it's kind of soundbite um, sound style. Um, the, the basic premise of, of doing this book really was um, to be a myth-busting book. The, uh, the problem that I saw as um, uh, somebody approaching this field as a researcher is that we often hear about young people and how they use technology through uh, mainstream media that is often coarse in its description of this, to put it... Um, to put it mildly, not to blame the media and the audience. I'm sure you're all wonderful reporters if you're here at Google. Um, but very often, the story that's told of a generation of young people is, first off, that they're dumber. There's a book right now called The Dumbest Generation, which has been published just ahead of our book. Um, I disagree with the premise of that. We'll uh, get into why. Um, secondly, that this is a generation of kids who were endangered, um, that they're more, more in danger than previous generations were because of the internet. Um, and the third kind of big myth uh, that's out there, I think, is that young people are bad. They're meaner to one another um, than, uh, than previous generations. Um, and so really I want to start by taking on kind of four of those myths um, and then uh, kind of go from there. So the first myth is really that it's a generation at all. I think one of the things that we uh, argued in this book and by virtue of pulling on other people's research and by doing uh, focus groups and interviews, is that it's really a population, not a generation. That um, the group that we've uh, sort of dubbed digital natives, other people have used this term, and we, we find it an uncomfortable term, actually, but one we wanted to kind of reclaim and make into a persuasive argument. Um, uh, there are three attributes of, of these young people. One, that they're born after 1980. Why 1980? Really, that that's the sort of advent of social technologies, the point at which bulletin board systems and so forth um, uh, kind of came online. How many people here born 1980 or after? All right, it's pretty good, actually. Pretty good. We've got two on the stage. 50% maybe is uh, working with the room. Um, secondly, uh, the people have access to the technologies. So one of the things that's um, obvious in, for anybody who's done tech policy um, is there is a digital divide in the world. Only about 1 billion out of 6.6 .6 billion people on the planet have access to the technology. So um, we're talking about the 1 billion who do have access. And then lastly, the thing that um, popped out of our research um, most obviously was um, also have the skills to use it, effective, sophisticated skills to use it, um, and have been uh, taught in an environment by parents and teachers and friends to use it in effective and sophisticated ways. There are lots of people falling on the other side of this participation gap um, uh, on, and who are not, I think, as well positioned to thrive in the sort of global information economy um, as those who are digital native. So, that's kind of myth number one, which is it's not a generation, but rather a population. And I think there are a lot of implications to those changes um, that we ought to pay attention to. Uh, so the second myth um, is this is a dumber generation. I've got two Harvard College students <laughs> next to me um, who I guarantee are not dumber than anybody who went through Harvard College. I'm not positive um, that I could get into Harvard College today, not so long after um, one, once upon a time getting in. Um, but I think one of the premises is that young people don't read as many. Sorry. <laughs> Boom. Um, something bad. Oh, it was your BlackBerry. You, you killed my BlackBerry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Maybe that's good. Maybe you need to be offline for a few minutes. 
Oh, yeah, get your back on the Blackberry front. Sorry, you can have mine. <laughs> <laughs> I think my wife would be delighted if you I took know, my it, Blackberry. It's so funny. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fine. My, uh, my son, who's six, um, writes out little tickets to my wife for talking on the phone too much. It's like a $20 ticket too much on the phone. And the tickets I get are Blackberry tickets. She gives me the $20 on the Blackberry too much. So anyway, I'll get, it'll be cheaper for me not to have it. Um, so on the dumber point, um, because young people, and some data show, are less likely to read one of these cover to cover, um, and there is some data to suggest this, the notion being that, that young people today are dumber than previous generations. Obviously, this is a facile point. They're not dumber. But I think, that, I think the trick that we have in this regard is to say young people are interacting with information just as much as before. It's in quite different ways. Um, and I want to ask my colleagues here to uh, describe some of it. Um, but they're also interacting with the information in ways that are really interesting, in ways that companies like Google and others are, of course, turning into business models and through YouTube and otherwise, that there is a very different relationship to malleable information, information that's in a digital format and that can be remixed and remade in different ways. And it's not, again, that every kid is doing this and in every school we're taking advantage of it. Far from it. But it really is to say, what is the different way of engaging with information that we ought to not just celebrate but encourage in schools and to teach digital media literacy and the remixing and the kinds of things that we think are, uh, are very important and good. Um, so that's kind of uh, myth number two. Uh, the third myth to pick up is um, that young people are more in danger than they were before. Um, and this is one that I think is um, natural to the nation's capital here, to some extent. Um, very often we see the um, stories about predators online, predators in social networks in particular. Um, very often the story is about stranger danger. It's that your young uh, child is going to meet somebody in a social network who's then going to lure them into some offline encounter and do some harm to them. Um, and the sad truth is that does happen. That does happen from time to time. Um, one of the things we're doing at the Berkman Center is chairing the Internet Safety Technical Task Force, of which Google and others are members. The 49 state attorneys general have chartered this group to come up with, this year, technical tools that might help in environments like social networks to keep kids safer. And so th there's a legitimate issue there to deal with. But the thing that is a myth is that kids are more in danger than they were a decade ago. The data simply don't show that kids are more likely to be abducted today than they were a decade ago. It just simply isn't the case. The fact is, though, that in some of these social environments, it is where kids are interacting with other people. It is where the meetings happen that used to happen in a park in some instances. So one of the keys, I think, to the book is figuring out how do we translate the strategies that worked or improve on the strategies that didn't in the offline world to the online world, which is where the social space um, is emerging and where young people are, in fact, interacting with information um, and with one another. Um, and then the fourth myth. The fourth myth is that young people are meaner to one another. Um, one of the things we've seen from the data about uh, safety is, sure enough, bullying online is on the rise. So it is absolutely the case that there is more examples out there and more people reporting um, bullying of a psychological variety, of a sexual variety, um, by their peers. So just as there isn't data, to show that people are more likely to be abducted, there is data to suggest that when you're online, you may be more likely to be harmed than you were a few years ago in these social environments. And I think one of the things we've been trying to parse out is everybody here has probably sent an email that they wish they hadn't sent, right? You send it and, they, oh, wait, come back, because it's too mean. You send something mediated through these technologies um, that you hit send on too quickly. And it's true that in many instances, people, there will be flames among young people and so forth. Um, but I think the aspect of this that's a myth is that one thing that's happened is the bullying that has always taken place in schoolyards is now happening in these online public social spaces. And all of a sudden, parents and teachers can watch it happen. You, all of a sudden, you can see it happening where you couldn't see it before in the, um, uh, in the playground. And you can see it after the fact. You can go back and watch the bullying have not happened. So what we're seeing is now a chance, I think, to um, interact more effectively with young people around these issues rather than just sort of blaming the technology and saying um, this technology is forcing people uh, to be meaner to one another. Um, so I wonder, if, can I pause there and put this to these two, uh, two, two guys here? Absolutely. So um, Sarah and Diana, quite wonderful people, um, they are uh, effectively co-authors of this book and of, uh, of this project, um, along with uh, several dozen other young people in the US, a, a cohort that was uh, in Switzerland during the time we did this project. We also did interviews in the Gulf and in 
uh, China. Uh, these guys um, were very helpful in framing the questions that we've uh, asked of young people, and then, in fact, remaking it, blogging it, editing it. I can tell that some of the harshest criticism of my chapters came from Diana <laughs> Kimball. I would submit a chapter to her, say, on identity, and then if I saw the little DK next to the <laughs> comment, I knew a, a zinger was coming. Um, so uh, in the spirit of uh, continuously editing um, this book and this story, I wonder maybe, Diana, if I can start with you and then go to Sarah. Of those four myths, where did I get it wrong in real time? Did I overstate or understate any of the harms you think that are uh, out there or anything you want to amplify? So I do think that this, this bullying thing is, is the, the major one. I think that stranger danger is always, it, it plays well to crowds because it's so scary to everyone. But bullying um, is something that may be part of a child's socialization process, as awful as it is to watch, but when, it, when it's out there in a public medium, then it becomes a spectacle. Um, and so I don't think, I mean, I think that was very right, but I think that it can't be stated strongly enough uh, that that's, that's something where being reactive is going to possibly cause more harm than good because it's not adult predators you're dealing with. It's, it's kids and their specific social patterns. And interfering in that can, uh, can interrupt some useful growth. But it does offer a good opportunity for conversation. Um, so that's, that's the one that I'd out. So we wrote this book for parents and teachers, sorry to say, for those who are policymakers and so forth or lawyers. It's not written for you unless you're also a parent or a teacher. That's really the focus of it. Um, what do you say back then if the answer is don't be reactive? Is the answer you should be proactive? Or what would you tell parents and teachers who are concerned about this legitimate concern of bullying online um, that they ought to do? I think that uh, the most important thing is to be in the conversation before something goes wrong. I think that uh, parents feel like uh, the internet is the space that they'd like to see what their kids are up to, but they want to surveil them rather than sort of uh, talk to them about it. So, I mean, when I was a kid, my parents would um, ask me sort of what I was up to on the internet, and we wouldn't sit down together and have me click through things and sort of, uh, you know, prove that I was telling the truth. They'd just ask me about it, just like they'd ask me about my day at school. And sure... Kids won't always be forthcoming, but if they know that that's a regular conversation, then they're more likely to bring it to your attention before it becomes a problem. And I, do, I think that the fact that it's in a public medium on the internet available to anyone shouldn't change that order of operations. And many parents, when I've made this suggestion, they say, no way. First of all, I don't have the kind of relationship with my kid that they're going to say yes. Secondly, they're only going to show me their friend's profile, not their profile. And third of all, I don't get the technology at all. Is this a realistic suggestion that I've been on the road making at your urging? <laughs> um, it's absolutely realistic because, uh, you know, teenagers never want to reveal their private worlds. But unfortunately for them, it's already revealed. You know, it's, it's already out there. And while Facebook, um, you know, Facebook, it's reasonable to think that, uh, you know, there, there are pretty good privacy controls. Not everyone's going to be seeing something. But anything you can find out uh, you know, just by searching on Google is, is grounds for conversation. But I think having confrontation about that is much less effective than just saying, uh, you know, show me, tell me. Um, right. Parents, you heard it here first. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but what, what is the basis for the recommendation? I mean, is it based, uh, is it based on having had discussions with parents of digital quote unquote digital natives. By the way, I'm equally yeah. uncomfortable with the term. It's, it's, a, it's an odd one. It's a weird term. Um, but um, so, so what is, is it the, is it, is the source material conversations with parents, conversations with educators? Uh, how are you reaching these, these recommendations? So what I'm basing this on is, you know, the product of John's research um, and then, you know, checking that with my own experience. Um, I had several experiences with bullying as a child that we're not online, but you know, my parents sort of staged an intervention at one point, which which did sort of solve the problem, but was hugely damaging to the social situation because it had already gone too far. Um, and bringing the parents in uh, interrupted the the cycles. And so I think that having seen that affirmed in the research um, makes it ring ring true to me as someone who wasn't 
a child too long ago. So just as a note on methodology, mm -hmm. the way that we did our research was basically to say, look, there are lots of smart people out there who know more about this than we do. So we first read a zillion people's <laughs> studies, quantitative studies. The Q Internet in American Life is a great one here in the US. There's a corresponding one in uh, England, the OXA survey and so forth. Um, we looked at lots of qualitative research. Dana Boyd, one of our colleagues, um, and others have done wonderful work. And then we conducted our own focus groups and interviews. So we basically went across um, uh, different social strata and asked in group settings these kinds of questions for each of the chapters. And then we followed up with interviews with individual young people where we thought it would be useful to spend an hour with them, say. And then we did another about 150 um, conversations with parents and teachers as the, as the core. So Sarah, where did we get it wrong in the, in the uh, myths, for starters? Well, actually, I want to comment on something what Diana said first, and then I'll answer your question. Um, just, un I unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, had parents who monitored my online use much more closely as a child. And um, at that time, we actually had AOL, and it was just, this was a really long time ago. And um, they put parental controls on me. And I remember being really, really frustrated by these controls because they wouldn't let me go on Google. We used, to, we used to joke that Google actually stood for google.com, which is why we weren't allowed on Google. <laughs> I've never heard google.com. Maybe. Uh -huh. but, uh, so this just, this, like, they're, they're, they're like, almost over-monitoring over me definitely led me through other ways that were perhaps more gray on getting the things I needed to go to. So I just wanted to pick up on that point about that parents um, monitoring every single thing that your children do online is probably not the best idea. Um, but as far as what I... I think you got wrong, or uh, I want to pick up on your point where you said that digital natives is a kind of an uncomfortable term for us to use, because I think through the course of working on this book and just talking with all my friends about it, digital natives isn't really synonymous with techie, right? I mean, there's a huge spectrum of people who grow up around technology, but there's also, there are people who are more, much more um, fluent and much more comfortable with it than others. For example, um, just talking with my roommate, as she was asking me, what is Twitter? And it's just that I think that it's easy when doing this research to say that um, to kind of categorize everybody as a digital native. And I think that you need to take into account that there's such a range of skills and this range of abilities within that generation or population. It's totally right. And one of the main criticisms we've gotten of the book so far um, has been uh, twofold. Some people saying we have been too quick to generalize, too quick to draw large conclusions because there's so much nuance in how young people use the technology. Um, and then other criticisms have been, we haven't made grandiloquent enough claims, right, that it's too cautious and too academic. So I'm taking some kind of solace in this, uh, getting it wrong on, on two ways. And what I thought was interesting is that, you know, you talk about myth busting, and, 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 and that's actually a very good way to, to, to approach it. But, but it also kind of leaves the question of, well, what is true? What, what are kind of typical characteristics? Are there any typical characteristics of so-called digital natives to the extent that, that you can actually define that population? So I have a bunch that are in the book, but do you guys want to think, you know, what resonated for you out of our research in terms of the attributes of digital natives? Um, I think that even though you kind of have a, a clear cutoff birth date for digital natives, it's really the fact that, uh, oops, sorry, um, we've just grown up around this technology, and it's, we've almost so, been so immersed in it, we don't think about it, right? That, um, that because everyone has a Facebook, we all need a Facebook profile. And um, I think that digital natives are actually a lot more savvy about certain issues than most parents like to think we are. I guess that uh, that also struck me too, is just realizing that I, I use technology all day long, every day. Um, I, you know, sort of would be an ultra super digital native, I guess. Um, in terms of usage, at least, if not skill. Um, you are super in other ways, too, Diane. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, uh, but I think just realizing that even if you, even if, you know, uh, I work at the computer help desk at school, and people will come up to me all the time and say, you know, I, I don't understand computers at all. The internet's not working. You know, what do I do? But even if they don't understand it at all, um, the ideal they're aspiring to is, like, understanding everything. There's an idea that that should be the norm, um, at least around the college campus we're on. Um, and I think that it's, it's completely, I mean, what, what marks for me being a digital native um, is that it seems obvious to, to go to the internet first. You may not be sophisticated about, you know, creating a collage of tools and using one service for video streaming because it can do it in high definition and another site for photo sharing because it has 
the best community. You may just use Facebook for everything. Um, but even that is uh, a huge step forward when, uh, when that is the obvious first destination. Um, and I think that we see that even, even when we're talking about the, the less proactive end of digital natives, just the fact that you would go to Wikipedia before a book um, means that there's a certain amount of obviousness there to the internet um, that was not there before. So that's a great segue. Do you mind if I do my, my fun videos here? Um, uh, two of the attributes, this is dangerous, being at Google with all these balls everywhere, and knock that over. Hey, John, like, it's free to sit on. Is it? Ooh, really? I think it might go badly. I think I, like your Blackberry, I think I would, right. I would tumble over. Um, so two attributes, in addition to the ones Diana described, um, of the most uh, sort of uh, clear cases of digital natives, and of course there are spectrums here, right? Um, and we're sitting with incredibly talented, you know, Harvard College students who are on the dramatic end of the spectrum. Um, but one is this notion of uh, not necessarily getting all of your information from this kind of format, right? So one of the questions we got repeatedly, my co-author and I, was why did you write a book about this topic? It makes no sense that you would do it in this format. Um, now, of course, part of it is because we are writing it for parents and teachers who still do like things in this format, and so that made sense. Um, but uh, part of the answer also was we're not just doing it ultimately in this format that um, what we wanted to do is to make a series of uh, different ways to interact with the same information. So online at digitalnative.org, we've got a wiki. So all of the research we've done, we've put up in different formats so people can actually edit it and interact with it. We knew this book would be obsolete on September 2nd, the day it came out, right? That was guaranteed, but we can have it live on. Um, there's a blog that these guys write on. Um, but a third thing that um, it exists in is uh, in some videos. And so since we're at Google, I was going to use the YouTube service um, uh, to demonstrate this. Um, we wanted also to encourage young people to retell the story of the book for other young people. So what we did this summer with some interns, these guys were off doing other important things. Um, we hired in some other interns. Um, gave them a little lunch money and gave them access to some, some tools. Um, and we basically threw the book at them. We said, here's a book that's about to come out. Um, wouldn't it be fun if you were to pick a chapter and uh, remake it for your colleagues? Make it in a format that if your colleagues do not read one of these, that they actually might get the same story of the book. Um, but I think it speaks to um, a couple things. One of the other attributes of digital natives, and particularly those on the sort of more creative end of the spectrum, is going from just being passive receivers of information to being people who create and recreate information, being much more involved in the remaking of culture. And I think that's where the promise of YouTube and lots of the other Web 2.0 um, technologies are, and that there's often a talking back. Right? It's a feedback loop to the receive messages. And if there's any great story buried in here, something that's wonderful in our future, it would be the um, grabbing of that. Forget the message for a second to the RIAA, but think about the amount of thought and ability that relatively simple tools and not high tech skills um, enabled somebody to do in reinterpreting a book uh, chapter in that way. I don't know, Sarah or Diana, do you have reactions to that? Do you think is that a, either a faithful um, reconstruction of what we, what we heard in the book, or, uh, or do you agree with where he came down? Um, I think it's very accurate. Just the, the ambivalence he shows uh, is definitely something that I have personally felt and that I know a lot of people feel. Um, I think that the, the most interesting moment for me is when he says that uh, you know, he, he realized that what they wanted him to do was become this emissary of doom. Um, and that he just wasn't going to do that. There's, you know, you, you're not going to be the spokesperson for something you've been punished against. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's definitely how I felt about it, but I think that uh, anyone who doesn't have that experience with the RIA is just working off of anecdotal fear, basically, um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the rules are really unclear. I felt like he said some things in the video that were really very true, um, especially in the sense that downloading music is it's not something you ever think about. You just do it because everyone else is doing it. And um, actually, I, I had gotten involved in the Berkman through a seminar I took my freshman fall. And um, one, one day, we were discussing the IRAA and the IRA's uh, tactics. And at the beginning of the class, he sort of like took an informal survey about what we thought about the IRAA. At the end, after we discussed all this downloading and um, yeah, suing their customers, everyone came out with a less favorable view of the RIAA. So I think it's definitely true that there's this alienation um, between the RIAA and students. And alienating your consumers is not exactly a profitable business model. 
what, you know, one question that, that, that I had when I, when I read that chapter is, how much of this is, is kind of youth rebellion uh, you know, that, that we've seen through the ages, or at least I think we've seen through the ages? Um, and how much of it is something that's particular or unique to, to the digital native population? So my reaction to that, just having done these interviews and um, uh, as a not a member of this population and not as a downloader myself, actually sort of I've come to it as an iTunes user because I don't know, I want to run for office someday or something, you know, I don't want to get in trouble. Um, but uh, in, um, in this particular story, over and over again, I heard about it as either I'm just doing it because I can and everybody else does it, it's just a herd mentality, or sticking it to the man, right? So many times people would say, I perceive this to be some rich guy out there or a rich artist like Britney Spears uses the example here, not as the artist on the corner struggling to make a buck and you know, feed their family, right? And one of the interesting things about this video, which just, just gets at it a little bit, is I, I think you start to see the empathy a little bit of um, when you see it as a person, as an artist on the other side, but not as an institution, a rich institution, all of a sudden the view of it does trip over the wrong line. Um, and the other thing that I saw in the interviews we did was once young people are in the position of the creator themselves, once they're the maker of that video, then the conversation changes, right? The conversation changes to now I have a series of rights, right? I don't understand how the copyright works and how uh, you know, fair use works and so forth to get to this point, but I now have to make a decision. Do I want to get rich? Do I want to sell it? Do I want to get famous and give it away? You know, do I want other people remaking my video? So there's a lot of that that actually, if we get into an education space rather than a you know, beating people over the head space, I think there's a lot of room for uh, a, a turn to this that's beyond just the classic sort of stick it to the man thing. So but I came at it with a something, somewhat of a hopeful view after that. Made by someone who did not have technical skills before the summer, who lived in Egypt and who came to the US for the summer, made me incredibly happy. Just the notion, not obviously the content, but the ability to take stuff that was basically offered for free online in the Creative Commons license using completely accessible tools and to remake knowledge in this particular way. And one of the interesting things was she added a bunch of stuff that's not in the chapter. That thing about the, you know, after the death, that's not in the book. These are things she went out and found and then kind of reinterpreted uh, what it was. This is one of the chapters that Diana edited harshly on me. Um, she knows um, all the pieces that, that have been added to it. But. What were, you, what were your reactions to uh, the retelling in video form? Oh, it's pretty extraordinary. I mean, I think that uh, certainly working on this project has helped me see um, how effective directed digital creation can be. When I was in high school, uh, teachers weren't quite on board yet, so all of our projects were still mostly papers and posters, um, but the occasional video uh, project, not even, you know, not, we would have to, you know, burn it on VHS, if that's even possible. Um, but just the act of making a video was this incredibly exciting thing. And kids would get together after school, they'd spend 10 or 20 hours on it at a time, um, just because it was fun to do together. Um, and I think that something like this shows the way to incredibly engaging assignments, because once you're creating a piece of art or commentary, uh, that people will see, the stakes become much higher, um, and the incentive creati for creativity is much higher as well. Um, and just seeing the, the CC licensed credits at the end uh, is, is proof uh, that there's so, many, there's so much material already out there that you can really just dive in and create from the very beginning, and that all that's, all that's needed is sort of the, the, the will. Um, and a reason to do it, and I think that teachers and parents can offer those reasons. So, we've received a lot of kind of food for thought. So I think that, that uh, I'm going to ask uh, one quick question, and, and then we'll start opening it up to the audience. Uh, there's a microphone right over there under that that light. So if, if anybody is interested in asking a question, please walk over to the microphone. In the meantime, um, you know the one thing that 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 uh, that really kind of jumps out at me here, though, is that um, you know, you have a, a, a chapter in the book that, that talks about information overload and, inf and the quality of information and how to manage, uh, you know, good information between good, inf quote unquote, good information and bad information. Um, how did you ensure that this is quali high quality information? And, and, and are you, in, in this process, are you helping to, to, to kind of maintain uh, or helping to kind of not just kind of throw out, you know, 
additional content, mm -hmm. and and instead actually creating content that that, that is useful. Because I, you know, for example, in the you know in the privacy video, uh, you know, I noticed one thing you know about Google, which is what I know about, right? So. Uh, you know, we, Google retains IP addresses for nine months, not you know in perpetuity. Um, and so it's it, you know it's kind of data like that that I wonder how how do you guys address how do you address that? Yeah, so I think this is a really good really good question, which is um, we raise some problems and then we create some of them, right? Or we you know engage with some of them through through the work. Um, so on the broader topic. What we wanted to do, of course, is to explore the nature of the book, mm -hmm. right? What is the nature of a book in a digital age? We may well decide this is a really good technology for the book, um, which it is, I think, in some ways. We also realize it's not the only technology for telling the book. And as someone, I now run a big library. We're trying to figure out how much do you buy in digital form versus this and so forth. How do you make it available? Um, but at the same time, uh, one of the problems with not doing it in this bound format, and when you trust other people to make it, um, you know what, if you're not the editor of it and you don't actually have the pen at the end of the day, I didn't, there's, you know, I think the notion of copyright law in the Zach McCune video, one of those things always makes me cringe a little bit about, you know, whether it's illegal to distribute the work or whatever. As a law professor, I think, well, maybe you didn't quite say that the way I would have. Um, you know, but to some extent, I think um, uh, there's a job of, for us as teachers to try to get it right. And you know what? If there's a specific thing that's wrong in there, we should go back and figure out how to edit it, um, much as Wikipedia entries get edited you know, communally. But on the other hand, I think there's some extent to which we do have to trust the users, right? We have to trust young people to do it uh, in a certain way. But I think you put it very squarely, which is as you have more people doing the, the distributed creation, um, you have to do some amount of trusting, but you also need to do some amount of correcting. So, a question from the audience. Hi, uh, hey John. I was struck by how you opened up the talk um, by framing the audience in this book as parents and teachers rather than college policy makers. This is like kind of a policy choice right there because there's some people who are down there without quality parents and teachers out there won't um, have these problems solved by the parents and teachers. So, I mean, <coughs> parents and teachers should read this book and better inform about their kids online lives, but the kids without this. How do you address that divide, I guess? So again, you know, there are, you have to make choices always, right? Um, and one of the choices that we made early on was that we felt that because of um, great policy counsel in Washington at law firms like the one you work at or the ones uh, here in this building, that there's a fair amount of information going to policymakers about these issues. But as we talked to parents and teachers, that seemed like the greater void that in a way that was a translation job that I wanted to do based on data um, and experience um, that we thought would have a greater impact um, than writing another book, you know, another law review article. And of course, as you know, we still write law review articles and these things that are ultimately intended for that audience. Um, but there's another problem buried in what you said, which is we do need to worry about the kids who do not have supportive parents and teachers in this regard. And we say this early on and often through the book, we're very concerned about this idea of the participation gap, which is Diana and Sarah are amazing with what they're doing. Um, and there are lots of other young people like them, not just in the United States, around the world. Um, you, no doubt, through your educational experience, had lots of experiences that make you facile in it, in these technologies, and able to do amazing things. But the people who are on the other side of that participation gap um, are really losing out. And I think that there is um, a fair amount of data. Our colleague Esther Hargitay has shown that it's socioeconomic status that is the largest indicator of being on the other side of that participation gap. Um, so our hope is that maybe somewhat some parents and teachers who are in the boat of um, you know, being parents and teachers to other kids on the other side of the participation gap you know, will get some of this messaging. But you're quite right. That's a, that's a, real, that's a real risk in both ways. Uh, another policy-related question. Um, the talk has me thinking about what this town will be like when the digital natives are policymakers. Uh, and in that regard, I'm wondering what the students, as well as Professor Palfrey, think of how policymakers or even the current candidates right now are addressing some of the issues that came up in the videos, uh, and how you see maybe the digital natives generation itching to change some of those policies. I think that's directed to my colleagues here, not to me. So, sorry. Um, I go first. <laughs> Hunted to Diana. Well, so 
That's a great question. I mean, uh, that's one of the, the sort of most fun speculative questions is how, how will digital natives change the workplace in the future? How will digital natives change policy? How will digital natives change Washington? Um, I think that the most important thing is that in, you know, in five or 10 or 15 years, uh, no one coming into Washington uh, will come without a personal knowledge of the social internet. So no one will come without uh, without having had experience with Facebook, having had that be integral to their friendships and relationships. Um, and there will be something much bigger and better than Facebook by then. And they'll probably be up on that too because they'll have subscribed to blogs in their RSS reader um, and they'll be up on the latest news. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, the, the big thing in Washington today is that when you have, you have an age participation gap too where you can't all speak using the same language or the same expectations because you don't have as much of a personal connection to it. I remember talking to um, an official from NBC who was saying, or yeah, it might have been NBC, um, who was saying that you know, as, soon as, uh, as soon as one major executive at one major media firm really enjoys like the internet comic that goes along with a TV show, then we'll see that, you know, then we'll see it with every show. So a lot of it's just about having the people who make decisions um, have a personal connection to the mediums, uh, the media involved. Um, so I, I think that there will just, as much as there is a big divide between digital and non-digital, um, I think that we'll see that fade over time as, as people come in with having that been a big part of their pasts. Can I ask, so John and I were born in 1972, right? So like, uh, I don't know, the year that the first Godfather movie was made. I think... Um, I'm curious to how you found that out. Yeah. Oh, because I'm a big Godfather fan. Oh, no, oh, no, 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 I think you say it in your book. Oh, do I? And it's also on your uh, Wikipedia page. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, weird. <laughs> I have my sources. Um, how do you know it's a good source? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So... Um, you, your book also talks about uh, um, digital settlers and digital immigrants. Um, it, you know, and I wonder, uh, kind of building on, on that question, whether we're not giving enough, uh, you know, enough credit to, to the settlers and the immigrants um, who, in some ways, I don't know, this is probably a bad analogy, but you know, converts to religion, right? Like, are kind of push uh, uh, kind of the dogma maybe a little bit more than, than somebody who's born into the religion. Um, haven't, haven't we already kind of pushed uh, kind of the, the you know this kind of uh, the digital agenda um, significantly. I mean, yeah. you know, you've seen Twittergate, for example. Yeah. Um, there's certainly uh, a lot of government openness initiatives that 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 are really kind of led by our generation and actually earlier generations. So, I mean, are we? No offense to you guys, but but are we romanticizing maybe a little bit uh, the you know your your particular population? At the cost of not acknowledging, you know, what guys like like you know, and gals like John have done. So, you know, we break down the world into lots of categories, as you do when you're trying to understand something. And we describe digital settlers as those of us who knew something before the internet. So we knew life before. We probably wore a Walkman to work uh, instead of an iPod the first time we went to uh, on the metro or whatever. Um, but we were there when the thing started, right? We were involved in shaping social media. We were involved in going to companies like this, investing in companies like this, making companies like this uh, in lots of ways. I think you're quite right to describe the um, openness and transparency things on the Hill. I'm a huge fan of the Sunlight Foundation, for instance, yep. which I think is investing in and making the possibility of a much more transparent government through these tools a reality every day. Um, you know, I happen to think that it matters that Senator Obama is a BlackBerry-toting guy and the, his opponent is somebody who doesn't send much email. I think there actually is a distinction here on having, not to be... Okay. No, no, I was just, I just mentioned, I mean, but, so I, I worked for McCain, as, as, as some of you guys know, and, yeah. and uh, I actually have uh, very uh, visceral memories of, uh, of watching YouTube videos with him. So, I mean, so he's very, you know, yeah. but... So he said he doesn't send quite so many emails, right, as, right. as Senator Obama, but maybe, maybe he's got, in this case, plenty of skills. But I do think that there is some extent to which, um, query as to whether watching a YouTube, anyway, no, not going to go in that direction. What were those? But no. <laughs> um, 
But I think fundamentally it's right. That if we describe only what these guys are doing as wonderful, that's to fetishize it, right? It's to say what they're doing is this other thing. And in fact, most of us are actually probably interacting quite the same way. Andreas here um, mentioned that uh, he saw a Twitter about this event that got him to come here, right? And I suspect you were not to out you here, but you probably weren't um, born after 1980. Um, and you know, I think that there are lots of ways that we all we all come to this. Um, the digital immigrant crew, I think, is slightly different. These are the people who still are sending out the joke emails to everybody on their AOL friend list, right? Um, or those urban myths that keep um, circulating. Um, and I think there may be some distinction there in terms of sophistication and pushing the agenda, though. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, Don Purcell with the Center for Global Standards Analysis. My question is very similar to the previous question. What did you see in your research that indicated what the impact is going to be on the American political process of the digital native population as it grows over time? Is it going to fundamentally change and shift much, if not all, of the American political process? You know, that sort of thing. Anybody want to take a crack at it first? Uh, well, someone who, well, for someone who's kind of like at the crossroads of that question, I guess it's really hard for me to look into the future. But I think that it's important to understand that um, kind of an online participation is still very different from a real life participation, right? It's, like, it's very easy to join a Facebook group that says, I support um, causes, co um, not I support global warming, against global warming, I support Barack Obama. But these are things, it's really easy, but it's not really anything that's really substantial. And I think that when it comes to political participation, you're still going to have that um, real life interaction that's what's really going to matter. Maybe it's easier to connect with people online, but when it comes down to um, doing the things, knocking on doors, it's still, there's, you're still going to have this real life interaction. So this is one of, the, one of the topics where I was hoping to find something that we didn't find, to be honest, in the research. So we kind of went looking for young people who are doing amazing things using technology to transform politics and civic activism. And our, uh, basically the last substantive chapter of the book is on activism. Um, and the fact of the matter is we didn't find as many as we would have liked, right? That just as when we're looking for creators, people making these great remix videos, there are some, but not as many as one, one might have hoped. Um, but what we did find was remarkable. So when there were young people who were doing these things, harnessing collective action in ways that um, really could transform things, we were um, it just really engaged by it. So one example is a young guy named Alexander Hefner, who I met last year as a high school senior, um, has now gone to college. Um, he started something called Scoop 08, and he'd organized 400 plus young people from high schools and college to fan, fan out across the country and cover the election in various ways, sort of in an alternate youth AP kind of thing, using, again, basic off-the-shelf technologies, no particular skill um, in the technical ways. Um, and I do think there is some potential in these um, remarkable collective action opportunities. But will it transform politics? I don't think we can make that argument based on the research that we had. I think it will improve transparency in certain ways. I think it will improve the ability to retell the story in the way that mainstream media only, you know, had a stranglehold on it. And in places going outside the US, places like uh, China and like Iran and other places, I think it can open up political systems. But I'm not positive it's going to transform American democracy if our data um, are to be believed. We have a, a growing line. Uh, maybe we can do like a speed round. Uh, right. uh, no. Talk faster. <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa Cooper. Alyssa Cooper from the Center for Democracy and Technology. I feel like one of the myths that I hear most often in the, pol most often in the policy world, I think it's a myth, is that young people don't care about their privacy. And I know the digital dossier kind of addressed uh, what data is out there about you, but I'm wondering if in your research you found uh, anything to indicate that young people don't care about their privacy or maybe that they just have a different conception of what privacy is, not that the conception is yeah. absent necessarily. And just to build on that really quickly, you, you have kind of this uh, separation uh, between identity and the dossier in, in your privacy analysis. And yeah. It would be great if you could kind of weave that into, into your answer. Sure. So thank you, listen. Thank you to the CDT for all you're doing on this topic. Very important, important work. Um, so this is one of the myths that I would say we can partially debunk. Um, on the one hand, we found that lots of young people are leaving lots of information about themselves in places like social networks, right? That is not a surprise, particularly. Um, but what we did find is that those who have been online longer and have spent more time doing it actually are quite sophisticated about where they're leaving, how they think about privacy controls and so forth. There's much more to be done in this way. But I was impressed, and I think uh, you know, probably Sarah and Diana um, are examples of this, by people who have thought about it much more than one would have thought. 
um, and who are, I think, peer-to-peer -peer spreading some of the gospel about being much smarter about this. Um, I do think it's an issue that will we'll continue. Um, we did distinguish between two things. One, the identity, and the second thing, the dossier. Um, we broke this down um, in part because others have made good contributions. Um, Professor Solov at, um, teaches here in Washington, has written a book about um, uh, the digital dossier point. But uh, I think the, the key distinction is with identity, in a way, you're shaping it yourself, right? It's, it's a way in which you are putting a version of your own identity into um, an online series of spaces, maybe called creating multiple identities, and where your peers are helping to create a social identity for you out there. Um, and that is something that at least you are trying to control on some level, um, and which is meant to be a reflection of yourself. The other is the dossier. And to be honest, my concern is much greater with the dossier, which is that lots of information is being held in lots of different hands, one of which, of course, is Google for many of us, another is Microsoft, another is Facebook, YouTube, whatever it might be. There are companies we don't have a relationship with, ChoicePoint, for instance, uh, for many of us, who probably does have some aggregation of data about us where we don't know that they, uh, they do and so forth. And this is an area where I'm very worried, actually, more worried than when I started the research um, that there are not strong privacy controls in many areas. Um, some companies are great about it. Some companies are not. The law isn't very helpful in the United States except in these very siloed ways. And I think we haven't seen a generation of people who have lived from cradle to grave, whether digital native or not, um, with this same idea of having so much information about you held in so many different hands um, with so few protections. So even if young people are sophisticated about it, I think there still is a problem down the road, potentially a train wreck that we haven't yet anticipated. You mentioned in your book that uh, that Americans, in the context of privacy, that Americans trust uh, uh, companies more than they trust government. Do you do you subscribe to that point of view? Do you agree with that point of view? You know, it's interesting. Again, privacy is one thing where I changed my mind in the middle of the research. I'm not really a privacy guy. I admit, initially, I thought, what do these privacy nuts have to hide? You know, that was sort of my, my view on this topic. And I, when you say privacy nuts, they're... sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Um, you know, leading my life in this way, where you know it's been recorded and so forth. Um, but I actually came to think that there's much more to be concerned about, um, and uh, I subscribe to it um, that view in the sense that. Uh, I trust some companies where I can get a really clear sense of what I think they're going to do and where I have a sense of the ethos and I know you guys, for instance, and so I'm happy to give my Gmail and I follow. When you move it to 18 months, I pay attention to that, right? Um, there are lots of other companies, though, that are out there who are collecting information about me that I don't know, and I do distrust that because I can't find out necessarily what they have. I can't correct it if it's wrong. I don't necessarily have many good rights to sue them if I could figure out what they had and that it was wrong. And then if you think about it on the government side, the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect me for things held in private hands, right? This is called the third party uh, data problem, right? Which is if information is collected by a third party and then the state searches on it, the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect me. And even if a government agency gets a certain amount of information, how they share it with other agencies is generally not protected by the Fourth Amendment and the statutes, I think, are way out of date. So I actually think after doing this research, I'm much more concerned for my six-year-old and my three-year-old on privacy than on any other topic. And, and yet, just, and I'm really sorry uh, to the people, but, but you, you, you don't seem to come out in favor of uh, federal privacy legislation that, that would kind of cure these issues and kind of update legislation So too. I don't come out in favor of a huge omnibus European style one right. because I think it's so cumbersome. Right. I think that the combination of the EU data directive and the data retention directive is just very hard to implement. Um, but I actually do think that there are statutory things that we ought to do, and I think we should rethink this Fourth Amendment one. So right. one I'm interested in is the right to demand deletion, right? which is I would love to be able for certain data to be able to say at a certain point, you need to delete that when I get rid of my profile. And some companies, of course, do that anyway or would do that on a regular basis, um, but many others don't. So, no, I think federal law, we should be looking at privacy legislation, but I think it's probably not in this overall omnibus way um, that we've seen in Europe, even though some of the principles of that, I think, are good. Got it. Well, it's a great ongoing conversation. Longer conversation, yeah. to be sure. I was born uh, long enough before 1980 that I haven't done any illegal downloading, though we made our share of mixtapes. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't understand what changed in the years from when such a hard sense of right and wrong has changed, where that Zach in the video was knowing that he was illegally downloading, yet he called himself a victim because he got caught and sued by the RIAA. And I wonder if any of you would comment on that. Sure. Well, I think that part of what happens is that 
all of this happens in this little screen, and the screen is where everything goes on. You know, that's where your browser is, that's where you know, your, your word processor is, um, and that's also where LimeWire is if you use that, or I don't even know what the latest one is. Um, and so it all just feels the same. They all feel like portals. If it looks, uh, if it looks legal, then it feels legal. Um, so I think that there's this, this limit, limit there uh, where if you were, you know, I made maybe some, some mixtapes. Uh, I was a little bit anachronistic even when I was little. But, uh, but I think that when you have to copy it so many times and it takes more than 1.5 seconds, then you're more aware of what's going on. And it's sort of like the time out in the corner, right? Go think about what you've done. Like the copying time means that you think about what you're doing. Um, and it, you don't have to think about what you're doing when it's lightning fast. I just don't think it was ever really a straight line, though, like a black line of what's right, what's wrong. Because when, you, like, I'm, when you're making mixtapes, you're sharing your music with friends. And I think that this whole music load down on things, like, oh, I'm sharing with the friends. And then it just gradually kind of becomes like, oh, I'm sharing with anyone. And then when it's just, as Diana said, just a little screen, and you, you're not thinking about, oh, I'm stealing from this um, artist, I'm stealing from this... Uh, company, it's you just it's you don't think about it anymore, and it's I think it was just like a gradual thing, um, and once that everyone around you feels this way, it's just non-reflective at all. The just, other, oh, go ahead, uh, no, go. Uh, the other thing is that um, sharing is a is a positive impulse. That's that's part of the problem here. Of course, people are going to want to share with their friends, um, and so you know, and that's that creates a lot of positive feeling around music. Um, that that's the source of a lot of a lot of positivity, but exactly as Sarah said, when you sort of expand that to be global, to be the most efficient way possible, uh, then that's where I guess that sort of breaks down. Just two other kind of two tidbits. Did, did you have? I'm sorry. Did you have? Okay. Yeah. Two tidbits of response. Um, so one was uh, these young people you've heard from here have a very clear sense of the copyright law, but there was a lot of confusion in our study about what is legal and what is illegal. So the RA suits have created a sense that, yes, downloading is generally illegal, but there's still tons of confusion about how the copyright law works. And then a lot of confusion on the remix side, what can you do with it, and much less knowledge on that side. Um, the other thing is, um, let's say out of 100 people we talked to, you know, 90-some said that they did illegal downloading. The rest of them said they did exactly the same thing only using iTunes. So they were doing the exact same act only when you drill down a little bit, their dad or mom had given them a gift card and they were spending down the 100 bucks or whatever they'd gotten at their birthday. So if you think about the act, the act is exactly the same whether or not lawful or unlawful um, and in a lawful service um, or one that they're using unlawfully. So um, it's no surprise that the Tower Records has liquidated its source and iTunes is the largest music retailer right now. I actually kind of have a, a follow-up question. Um, this is really tall. Um, up, way, that's like my daily experience. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. I'm right there with you. Um, so actually, my follow-up question is that it was interesting for me that after the um, RIAA video, the conversation turned to rebellion um, rather than around control or ownership or collaboration. Um, and I'm interested to hear kind of what you all found about now that there are more tools like Google Spreadsheets, Google Documents that I use every, every day of my life, um, now that there's more of a kind of air of collaboration around technology, um, I'm interested in kind of hearing what you all found around whether it was rebellion um, against the RIAA or whether it was just, I'm used to using technology for collaboration, so why wouldn't I do that? Did you all get in, a sense of that? Well, I do think that, uh, <clears throat> I, th I think there's something to that. I'm not sure if, you know, collaborative authoring is something that happens much until college, although it totally explodes freshman year when you have to, you know, do your problem set together uh, at two in the morning. Um, so I think that, but, but I think that's an extension of the sense I was talking about, about just wanting to, like, share and improve everyone's experience. Um, and so the, the rebellion, I, I think that it's hard to feel like you're rebelling when you feel like you're doing something actually positive. I think that there's, uh, I think that what needs to happen with services that, that traffic in something that is sometimes illegal and sometimes not is to shift the focus to person-to-person -person interactions because those are much less likely to involve, you know, uh, downloading a thousand songs all at once just for the heck of it and much more likely to 
have the positive feeling towards an artist attached to it because it comes from someone you know. Um, so I think that insofar as the RIAA needs to repair, uh, repair people's feelings, I think it's a shame that um, you know, Mux Tape didn't end up uh, being able to work out an agreement with the record labels. Uh, Mux Tape was this great service um, that where you could just upload songs and uh, stream a mixtape um, that someone else had made that had anywhere, you know, anywhere from two to maybe topping out at 15 songs. It wasn't a lot. And people loved it. It was a great way to find artists. It was a very simple, sparse program. Um, and uh, so when the RIA got wind of this, uh, the founder of Muxtape went around and tried to talk to the record labels about getting a licensing model together. But in the end, they were interested, but they just couldn't seem to make that leap. And that was a perfect scenario where all of, you know, it was very low, uh, low impact in terms of sales. It created a lot of positive feelings around the artists. If the RAA had gone along with it, it would have made a huge difference in how people felt about the RAA, and that would have been a great token thing to accomplish. And I know that it wasn't the RAA, it was the record labels, but it's all part of the same, part of the same issue. Ma'am. Um, Diana and Sarah, I'm going to ask you to think back on your times in high school. And you've described today um, how you're using, using social networking and Web 2.0. Um, in high school, did you use it as part of your school experience or your personal experience outside of school? And then the second part of the question is, what do you think needs to take place in schools for them to really um, realize the opportunity and the value of some of these social networking tools? Um, so I actually began using Facebook while in high school. Um, I think I was probably the first generation that got to use Facebook before high school. So, but even before Facebook, um, the internet was a huge part of my social life. I mean, every, practically everyone I knew was on AIM. And that was almost one of my primary social outlets every night. You know, when I was done with my homework, I'd go on AIM. Or if I was having trouble with my homework, I'd go on AIM. And um, I think that the internet today is probably a larger part of my life just because I have my laptop with me and it goes with me everywhere. But social networking has been a tremendous part of my life all throughout high school. As far as um, how, do we, how do we use this in school, I think that I honestly feel that there's actually a lot of resistance among students almost using these technologies. Because I've now I've taken classes where we had to do class wikis or class blogs, and students have been really reluctant to use this. I don't know if this is just a reflection of maybe, oh, we're done discussing class. I don't want to discuss this after as homework, and this is just extra work. But I think that um, I think it's not just that we need to educate teachers. I think that students also need to students also aren't exactly you know we don't think of using blogs as an educational tool when you ask most of us, and I think that it's really um, on both sides that we need to figure out how we want to use technology the best in classrooms. Oh, go ahead. Just because we're running. Sir, yeah. your question. Oh, hi. Thanks. This is, uh, I'm Sean Dakin with um, StopPoliticalCalls.org. We're fighting for the privacy rights of the American voter. But I'm actually very interested as a parent of a four-and-a-half-year-old um, about, you know, cyberbullying. And, and really, um, you know, my wife was a medical director at a boarding school uh, for three years until this summer, uh, and they had numerous instances of, uh, of cyberbullying. Of course, it's a boarding school. You're there 24-7. But, uh, in fact, my brother, who's a Harvard Law grad, um, is, is deeply af afraid when his kids get older of the bullying that he experienced at school where it stopped when he left. He could go home to the safe ha haven of our home it will follow the person into the home, and it will follow the person onto the mobile. So it's not like, uh, you know, my wife is like, well, we'll keep the computer in the, in the living room. Uh, and I'm like, you know, that, that age is going to be over when our four-and-a-half-year-old is time to use it. He's going to have his, you know, iPhone, whatever the next thing is going to be, Android. Uh, and people are going to be bullying him, you know, in his bed. Um, and so that's something I think is, is something really, really kind of scary as a parent, you know, just a parent. And I wanted to see what kind of data you got around that. So it's not something that lends itself exactly to data, but a couple of kind of observations from what we saw. So you're quite right. One distinction here is the connectedness, right? So the connectedness of these devices um, to people's bodies. Sir described the extent to which her laptop is on her body all the time. 
This is one of the first questions we asked young people. Um, we'd ask them about, you know, what's your favorite digital device, which was a weird question. They didn't get it. They just, the, the whole, this digital, not digital, it's all converged. But in any event, once we got past that, um, there was always a phone or a Blackberry or a, you know, sidekick or a, a laptop somewhere on their body. And I think this is one of the things that's different, which is, and maybe this is true of digital settlers too, we always have the device and the connectedness then um, to our peers on our body. And that's good and bad, right? Sometimes we need not to have it. Sometimes we have to knock it off the table and break it or whatever else. Um, I and I know it's true. It's like, where is it? What, what happens if I get yeah. Um, uh, and I think for teachers, one thing we have to do is sometimes say, there's no place for technology in what we're doing right now. Laptops down or laptops out of here or just do it face to face, right? Um, so the connectedness is one. Another is the persistence of it, right? Which is to say, if you do this bullying that exists online, and then it exists there later in the day, or a month later, or years later, right? That same story could be much more painful if it exists like this tattoo that you can't get rid of. And worry not just about the kid who's harmed by it, but the harmer. So one of the things we heard from was a lot of kids who were um, very sorry that they had done it and wished that it would go away that they had done it, but it doesn't. Um, and this is an artifact in some ways of uh, some of the legal regime we have around this. Um, and the fact that these harms are psychological and reach into kids' bedrooms, these are all different. I don't have any answers to this, I have to say. Um, I think that this is one of those really thorny issues where we need a community approach to this. There's no law that you could pass against cyberbullying that's going to end this. Um, I think you do have to look back to schools and say, what do you do with regular bullying? How do you approach that? Is it honor codes? Is it rules? Is it punishments? And figure out how could we translate that same scheme that's worked relatively well um, to this online space. But I think we also have to look at the rules around defamation um, online and so forth. And this is where sometimes it gets into a much longer policy conversation, but where I part company with some of my uh, fellow travelers in the internet law world thinking about how the defamation law works um, in the online space for exactly this reason. So we have question, uh, time for a couple more questions. We have one at the microphone. Uh, by the way, if there are any kind of digital natives who kind of either strongly agree or strongly disagree or just have anything to say, please make your way to the mic. I, I wish they could just like I am. That's uh, right. Like, asynchronous right, Exactly. Exactly. Well, we, we actually have a good tweet. Yeah, yeah we actually do it. have. Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Alicia Tucker, and I'm in D.C. working on a project that's digitizing documents related to the Constitution. It's called Consource. Um, but before I came to the project, I was a high school history teacher at a unique charter school where each of the students had their own laptop. And 100% of my lessons had some type of connection to the Internet, either whether it was through my own preparation of what to teach them or through the way I designed their projects. And you've debunked the myth that this generation is dumber, but I would like to know what your um, perspective would be of that this generation is smarter, because I was consistently impressed with the connections that they would make, and I, and I believe it was because of the, ac the immediate access to information that they had, that if they, something interested them, it would lead them immediately to some other blog or another article or something, when previous to the internet, they would have had to physically be in a library, go and look up a book, and there wouldn't be that immediate gratification to their interest. So are students smarter in this generation because of access to the information? You guys want to take that? Yeah. I mean, are, I definitely are you, like are to you think smarter? I'm smarter. Yeah, so are you smarter? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that they can be, and that's one thing I've realized for myself is that I berate myself for spending so much time on the internet. Um, but in truth, you know, I'm just fulfilling, you know, I'm satisfying my curiosity. Like, it's a good thing to be curious and to, to follow those garden paths uh, to more related information, and I think it, you know, all of the information is there, and so I think that for, it, it makes it much easier to make that connection early on. I don't think it's an issue, I mean, smarter is always about um, approach to information, not inherent ability. So I think that uh, the ability, you know, having, having the access to a computer or the internet to be able to find that information at the moment of interest means that an enduring interest is more likely to take hold. And I think that one of the sort of charming and weird things about Facebook is that, and all social networks, is that you sort of have to list your interests, and there's a high premium on having esoteric interests. So, uh, so if you sort of develop this esoteric interest in uh, you know, playing cards throughout the ages, and you've researched on Wikipedia, and you've bought some things off eBay, that makes you cool, right? That makes you... Um, 
unique, and I think that the ability to have an interest that you've just found through information be part of your identity is very, very important. So I've had a short introduction to your service, which I think is great. I share a common cause with you in terms of put digitizing materials and, and creating these environments, obviously, where young people can learn either by reading a book, which I still think is a good idea, and please do it, um, or interacting with it in these ways. Um, I guess, I'm, I, though I like the question very much, I don't think smarter or dumber is really, I don't think we're ever going to prove it. It just doesn't seem to me something that we can track. I think the point is, though, for schools in particular to say young people are learning differently. You know, 100 out of 100 young people, when we said, how did you, you know, do a book report or whatever about a topic you didn't know about, like the Spanish-American War or uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, they all open a browser, not yet Chrome, they opened IE or uh, Firefox, they uh, went to Google 100% of the time, pretty much, typed in Spanish-American War and then went to the Wikipedia entry. And it was only then that we saw variation in terms of whether they cut and pasted it from there into their book report, took it as the gospel, um, or did they think, oh my gosh, you know, Sarah was there five minutes before, she changed a fact so I would get it wrong, right? So you had this, <laughs> this real distinction about um, whether or not it's sophisticated and thinking about it or not. Um, but smarter or dumber, probably not, but getting information differently, yeah, absolutely. And they're going to learn about the Constitution from you probably much more likely than from, you know, some uh, kind of bound volume. Oh, that's what we're going for. One more tidbit that um, as a digital native myself, I used Facebook in one of my lessons. I projected my own profile and some other stuff. So I, I agree with you in my own experience that it is changing the way that in the classroom as well. Last question. I'm guessing, as you would say here, I'm a digital native. But I was wondering how it's affecting people's social life. Because lots of people, there are networks like Facebook and MySpace and all sorts of stuff that you can go on. I'm wondering if that's affecting how people react in real life. Because why go over to a friend's house when you could just talk to them on Facebook? Is it like deteriorating how we interact with people and like making us just wanting to resort to talking to them over to the internet instead of going up to them face to face? I think that's definitely not the case. Um, my closest friends are people who I know in real life and interact with in real life. I think there's there's always been a premium on face to face conversations. But I think as far as Facebook is that it makes um, it makes visible connections that are usually invisible, right? Like I actually found out that one of the summer interns on the Digital Natives project was on from the same town as me. We found out because on Facebook. Yeah, I think that that's, that's always a fear that arises, but I think that the college environment is a really good place to test that because, um, you know, the, the thing is that everyone at Harvard feels like they need to be doing their homework all of the time. This is not true everywhere, um, but at, at Harvard, certainly, uh, you, you're in front of your computer because you feel like you sh should be doing more work, um, but you actually end up interacting with more people while you're at the computer because it feels like the workspace. Um, and I think the main danger is just that there, you know, we're we're three D creatures, right? You know, it, moving to a new environment changes the changes the mood, changes you know, changes the task your mind's doing. It's a great way of switching from one mode to another. And when all of what you're doing is in the same mode, then the switching cost becomes very high. The cost to leaving your room uh, to go see someone is higher. But if you see on Twitter perhaps that someone is already somewhere then the, there's already an incentive to leave. And so it's both things. Um, I think that the, the cost of mode switching makes it uh, possibly a detriment to face-to-face -to -face interaction, but uh, the availability of inf information about opportunity makes it a plus. So I think it, it, it balances out on the end, but it, it will only exacerbate people's tendencies. Absolutely. Introspective people will become, you know, the people who are introverted will become more introverted and vice versa. Okay. The professor would like a final word. Well, I, I know I stand between everybody and a beer back there, and I hope you'll stick around for one. Um, but, you know, I think this is one of the, again, one of the questions we approach the research with, which is, are we not breaking bread as much as a result of, you know, having these online conversations? And I don't know where the time comes from, but I don't think the answer is that we are taking away that much. Um, I think we still do need to kick our kids out the back door and make them play soccer sometimes instead of playing video games. And I think you do have to sometimes say, stop SMSing, pick up the phone, or go see them, right, to some extent. But somehow, it, you know, this is something that I think if we care about it, will balance itself out. And maybe I'm Pollyanna-ish and glass half full and whatever. But somehow, I didn't see a deterioration of the strength of friendship. You did see more loose ties, um, but I think there's still strong ties. And I think 
actually, you know, one thing I would point to is this gathering right here, right? We all may have learned about this in different ways through digital technologies, more likely than, than mouth of, you know, word of mouth, um, but yet we've come together to talk about this in real space, even though we could watch all the videos or experience it with the wikis, but no, we actually come together with our good friends from Google, for which are very grateful that you've posted this, um, and as this venue, we still do come together in physical space, despite the fact that we may learn about it digitally. So I think the point is, it's actually moving to a hybrid space, not just purely digital. We're not all going to end up in Second Life, you know, as the way that we hang out. We, you know, and I say this to the distant students that I sometimes teach: come once and break bread with us for one class. You can't just learn it all digitally. Um, so I think this is a really good physical manifestation of the answer to that, that question. And to uh, Pablo, I'm very grateful for the chance to be here. Thank you, John. John, uh, Sarah, Diana, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much for joining us for this talk. Hope you make it to the next one. <laughs>